you have, and welcome back, and some of you, welcome for the first time. We started these last year. Uh, they happen most months, and uh, sometimes we've had three or four of us, and sometimes we've had 40 or 50 of us. You never can tell. Um, depends on how outrageous uh, the topic might be or, or whatever. But part of it is we've been inviting uh, people who we're interested in hearing what kind of things they may say uh, that would be interesting to our community here at Fairgrind so that we can have some uh, good discussions uh, back and forth. We reached out and have set this up in the very beginning for Jordan. We wanted him for one of the first ones, uh, but he was traveling forever in a day, it seemed, and now I understand a little bit more why. Um, we'll hear more about that tonight. Uh, but Jordan Clarity uh, is well known as an advocate and activist in this community and as an author. He certainly uh, wrote Floodlines and uh, uh, has been involved with a number of publications, Left Turn, I, you know, I don't know that I could say where they all are now and how they're all doing, but they've always been important in providing perspective in, in New Orleans and in, in the world past New Orleans. And, uh, when I was asking him, you know, how to do the flyer for this thing, I found that he'd been also helping produce this show with Al Kozara, which, if you're not familiar with it, is the Middle Eastern English language uh, TV channel that has become a very reliable and important voice, particularly now in the Arab Spring. When we were in Egypt, we watched it uh, for months beforehand, if we could get a hold of it. So. Uh, I know I want to hear more about that. Hopefully that doesn't bore everybody else. And the way these things work is we're going to ask Jordan to sort of make some remarks. I think the topic we called it was how his perspective on this time of various movements, Occupy, Arab Spring, so many other things that are going on. Uh, so he'll speak for uh, as long as he's interested and willing. And then we open it up and people ask questions about either something you've heard him say that uh, provokes your interest or something you might have on your mind. Fair enough. We're such a small and hearty band, what if we introduced ourselves? I'm Wade Grafty, obviously, from Fair Grimes. My name is Glenn Winter. I'm a physician and um, work mostly for County Hospital in Chicago and live here now. And it's been a faithful uh, dialoguer, so he's one of my veterans here. Um, my name is Brianda Decker. I lived in the city for about four years and recently I went to grad school and I just recently moved back. So. Welcome back. Um, my name is Ross Trace. I'm visiting Brianda in Buckman. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, um, and this is uh, something happening on Monday night. <laughs> uh, my name is Emily Ratner. I'm a student at Right. Right. Dennis Fermento. I'm a poet and teacher. I live here most of my life. Andrew Lopez. Um, I work in the library at Delgado Community College across the park there. Sure. Beth Butler, a community voice. I'm Marie Hart, a community voice. And Jordan, just to take over. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lee, and your friends for having me. And, uh, yeah, this is very exciting to be here. Um, uh, I usually. Uh, I usually go note free, but I actually brought some notes because I have some quotes that I want to use, so I want to be accurate. Um, but before I go to that, I want to say, um, you know, the, the theme that uh, we discuss is this idea of, of the state of movements, and also I think the state of media, and I think that both face a similar crisis related to uh, both sort of corporate media and corporate movements. And, uh, and I think there's a lot, this sort of sickness is something that they both have in common. Um, and so I wanted to sort of talk about both of that and the ties between both of those and get into discussion afterwards um, uh, off of those themes um, or off of something else that people choose. Uh, so are people here familiar with this phrase, the nonprofit industrial complex? Anyone not? Okay, so, okay, well, so um, this idea of the nonprofit industrial complex was uh, turned by an organization called Insight Women of Color Against Violence. And they were specifically expressing this concern, and this was about 10 plus years ago, this concern that uh, 
the, the move, movement, social justice organizations were becoming more accountable to wealthy funders rather than to the people that they serve. Um, and especially a lot of people in that organization came out of um, the domestic violence movement. And they're talking about how these domestic violence organizations, um, because of sort of uh, wealthy funders and also um, uh, um, federal funding, had sort of been switching to this model of criminalization uh, as a solution to domestic violence. And that was actually ending up doing much more damage to communities and not actually helping the woman most in need. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's, this idea is something that goes back to, you know, at least 100 years before that. Um, the, this idea that, uh, that being accountable to these funders is, is a problem. This is where the first of a couple of these quotes I wanted to, to read comes. Um, so Marcus Garvey, in 1922, said, uh, the person who lives on the patronage of philanthropists is the most dangerous member of our society because he's willing to turn back the clock of progress at any time when his benefactor asks him to do so. Um, moving forward to 1963, Ella Baker, who was one of the main organizers of SNCC, um, commented, I'm very much afraid of this foundation complex, on the, this idea of foundations. Um, I also want to quote from uh, 1970, uh, John D. Rockefeller, of course, from the, hey, from the Rockefeller Foundation, um, the, there's a John D. Rockefeller Commission on Foundation and Private Philanthropy that I think laid out many of the goals of, like, of foundations that we see today. And they said, the spirit of dissent has spread its contagion across our student population and from there to other sectors of American life. If they are not to reach their climax in a war of all against all, we are summoned by this turmoil to carefully consider the ways in which we can convert dissent into a force for constructive action and civil peace. Mm -hmm. we, must evolve, we must evolve more responsive processes for which our young and disenfranchised can secure a fair piece of the social action, whether or not they can acquire a piece of the affluent economic action. Right. So this idea of, of turning this dissent into uh, this so-called social action that would not actually address economic imbalances. Um, I was just recently reading the uh, autobiography of David Gilbert, one of the Weather Underground members. He talks about his political development. He says, I was in transition from a liberal who wanted to, quote, uplift the oppressed to make them more like me, to a revolutionary who realized that oppressed people themselves must become the arbiters of their own destiny. And I think that that's one of these key um, uh, issues that we have with this nonprofit industrial complex, this idea um, that it's these people of privilege that are dictating the way they want to see the social change carried out. I think you know another aspect of, of this foundation problem. So foundations in the U.S. today have an estimated um, this figure is from a couple of years ago, so it's probably higher today, but uh, 500 billion dollars of wealth um, at their disposal. And you know some people say, well, you know that's their money or whatever. Why why do we care? Other than the overall injustice, I think that point that was originally made by Insight is this idea that that wealth is money stolen twice over. So in the first sense, it's stolen in the classical sense of, of capitalism, right? This idea that, um, that people gain this wealth through the work <coughs> of others, right? That it's, it's through other, other people's work that this wealth was, was um, you know, whether it's through the mines or through whatever businesses you should own. And then the second way that this wealth was stolen is then those wealthy people owed that money through taxes and put the money through foundations so that they wouldn't have to pay that money in taxes, right? And so that then they still had control over that money um, and could dictate what, what they were doing with it. So um, by putting in, in this foundation, they're able to use it as this form of social control um, and uh, instead of giving it to a somewhat theoretically at least accountable government that then can you know then is somewhat accountable to people through elections. We can critique how that's not really true, but that's the idea, right? Um, so this money is is twice stolen that is used to further these ideals. And um, another point that people have talked about this nonprofit industrial complex has said is if you look at um, let, let's let's say that there are wealth 
roughly three groups that you can categorize these wealthy foundations in. So uh, a relatively smaller group is actually the conservative foundations. So I think um, when I say conservative, hopefully we all know basically what I mean, but we're, you know, there's a certain agenda. We're talking about the Koch brothers. We're talking about um, a lessening of the public sector, um, a lessening of restrictions on the so-called free market, all of this, right? Then actually the largest group is uh, the liberal nonprofits. Um, and so I think, again, we probably all have an idea of what I mean when we're talking about liberal, right? But um, general sort of Democrat politics, um, in large, you know, a stronger public sector. And then we have a, an extremely small group that is the more progressive funding, the more progressive nonprofits. Um, and that, I, I, I would say, is wealthy folks are actually interested in challenging some of the fundamental power imbalances in our society. So that's a very small pot of money that's actually going to progressive process. Now, part of the problem is most of this liberal, this large group of liberal money is going to um, is going to organizations that are lessening the harsh effects of our society, right? So they're going to support homeless shelters, they're going to support soup kitchens, they're going to support the, these things that, you know, that's the vast majority is going to this various relief of people cut out from, from this sector. Most of the conservative money is going towards ideological battles, training people to ideologically fight um, against uh, a, a large public sector. So they're ideologically pushing this idea that the government should not be responsible for poor people, the government should not be responsible for these regulations. And so actually what these liberal uh, uh, foundations are doing is they're actually in their work supporting the path of, of what the conservatives are asking for, right? They're enlarging this non-public sector and sort of enlarging the safety net that the, gov that the government is not providing, sort of um, helping, that, helping that to exist. And so make, you know, kind of making through their actions that actual like, strong government less, um, less effective. And they're actually very reluctant to, um, you know, to fund people that are fundamentally challenging the system. Um, and I think living in New Orleans in this period after Katrina, I feel like we've all seen that um, in a very dramatic way, you know, and uh, I've said before, it felt in those first months after Hurricane Katrina, like the sky was filled with money. Like 30 feet up in the air, there was this stream of 50 and $100 bills just like going through the air. Um, and that if you could sort of get up on a ladder and like jump up in the air, you might grab a handful. But it was, so it's all this money that was from Washington for hurricane relief, that was from the Red Cross, that was from donations that people had made. Um, and it was aimed towards the Gulf Coast, right? So it went above our head. But then it sort of continued out and went um, right away from the Gulf Coast again with, you know, very little of it actually making into people's hands unless they could sort of metaphorically jump on that ladder and grab a handful. Um, so in terms of the government money, right, it went to these Bush cronies, it went to Ashbrook, it went to Halliburton, it went to Kellogg, Brown and Root, it went to Blackwater, right? Um, so they uh, got these, you know, tens of millions, hundred million dollar contracts to do this reconstruction. Most of it went into their pockets, very little went to the people most in need. But also in terms of this, uh, this more progressive money, that also was going to East Coast and West Coast nonprofits, and very little of it was going to the organizations based here in the Gulf Coast. And so people were giving this money with this idea that it was going to go towards uh, Gulf Coast recovery, that it was going to the recovery of the people on the Gulf Coast. But um, even these organizations based here uh, did not, for the most part, see this money. And I think of um, organizations like Around the Corner, um, the Community Book Center, which was a really important community gathering space that still is, is barely getting by. Um, you know, I've seen almost none of that, that money, but I think it's been a really important organizing space for many different communities. 